My name is Jim Turk. I'm the director of the Center for Free Expression at Ryerson University. I would like to begin today by acknowledging that the land on which I'm speaking to you is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now the home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. I also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. On behalf of the Center for Free Expression uh, at Ryerson University and our co-sponsors for today's event, which are the Edmonton Public Library, the Milton Public Library, Penn Canada, the Thunder Bay Public Library, the Toronto Public Library, and the Vancouver Public Library, I want to welcome you to the ninth in the Center for Free Expressions in Conversation series, which feature prominent guests discussing important issues in the current political moment in which democracy is under threat, public discourse on vital matters is fragmented into self-affirming ideological bubbles when not discouraged altogether, and censorship is increasingly seen as an ally rather than as an impediment to social justice. Today, we are returning to the theme of conflict, harm, and repair. The title is Conflict is Not Abuse, Overstating Harm, Community Responsibility, and the Duty of Repair. Our conversation today feature, features Sarah Schulman. Sarah is an award-winning novelist, playwright, screenwriter, nonfiction writer, and AIDS historian. Her 20th book, let the record show a political history of ACT UP, New York, 1987 to 1993, will be published by FSG in May. She is a distinguished professor at the City University of New York College of Staten Island. Welcome, Sarah. Hi, thank you. We're pleased that Sarah <clears throat> will be joined in conversation today by Lana D. Povitz. Lana is a writer and social, his social movement historian she is currently working on the biography of, Ca of Canadian American feminist Shulamith Firestone and her sisters Leah and Tirza. Lana's work has appeared in the Los Angeles Review of Books, Feminist Studies, Histo Hist Histoire Sociale, Social History, and the Canadian Historical Review. She is visiting assistant professor of history at Middlebury College in Middlebury, Vermont. Welcome, Lana. Thanks, hi. In, today's, in terms of today's program, after about 45 to 50 minutes of conversation with Sarah, Lana will turn to the audience to bring you into the conversation. Uh, as you listen to their conversation, if you have a question at any point uh, from the beginning on, uh, look to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A tab. You can click on that and write out your question uh, while you're thinking of it. Don't wait till we get to the question period to start writing down your questions. The chat function doesn't work in this webinar, Zoom webinar function. You have to use the Q&A button. So we encourage you to pose questions that you would like uh, Sarah and Lana to talk about. Um, I guess that's, uh, that's everything I have to say. So now it's time to turn it to Sarah and Lana. Great, thank you. Thank you. Well, it's very exciting for me to be here to talk about some of the ideas in your very provocative and important book, Sarah. You once said to me, and I think you've said in other places, that all your books are actually conflict is not abuse. In other words, there are some big ideas that really lie at the heart of your intellectual project as a writer and activist. So for example, the idea that people all have motives and that good relationships like good art requires that we try to understand what those motives are. Um, the idea that any pain that humans can create, we can transcend the importance of direct communication, the move, the need to move beyond complicit bystanding to actively participating in processes of change. And of course, the importance of being self-critical. All of these ideas exist throughout your work, but conflict is not abuse is by far the most explicit laying out of these fundamental ideas. One of the great, but almost throwaway phrases you offer in the introduction to that book is that this is not a book to be agreed with. Instead, it's a set of ideas that each reader needs to parse for themselves. Some parts will resonate, others will be rejected. Some moments may even trigger. And it's been really remarkable to follow as you and I both have uh, the range of 
commentary that this book has inspired. Even a quick search on Twitter or Goodreads or Facebook will turn up thousands of comments, wildly different in tenor and tone. One person's victim blaming garbage is another's lucid, honest, and challenging manifesto. <laughs> this is a book that's being read around the world from Copenhagen and Mexico City to Paris to Moscow. It's been cited by Black Lives Matter activists, um, James Baldwin scholars, internet influencers, high ranking leaders of art institutions, you name it, someone's talking about it. And, you know, personally, Conflict has been a book that has really changed my read uh, on difficult situations that I see in my life as an activist, as a teacher, as a friend, as a family member. One idea, just as an example, that has really struck me is this idea that we might be eligible for compassion or understanding from members of our, of our community, even if it's conflict, if it's not abuse that's occurring. Um, that's been really powerful. And I think it feeds into larger conversations that many of us are having now about abolition and, and the need to understand like the mechanics that will actually get us beyond a punishment paradigm. I've also really appreciated the chance to think about the distinction between power over and power struggle. And I'm sure we'll return to this, but, and of course those, those distinctions can be really subjective, but I think important to try to parse. And it's also helped me think about the importance of de-escalating situations before they turn into abuse by intervening. And I hope you can come back to this too, the idea that it's uh, important to take the time to have difficult conversations and also with the recognition of how often this feels like such a big ask. So obviously I could talk for ages just myself about this book, but I'd, I'd love to hear from you. So let's go back to the beginning. Conflict is Not Abuse has now sold more than 30,000 copies in nine printings, but initially you had trouble finding a publisher. Could you talk a little bit about what it took to get published and why you think it was so difficult to get published in the first place? Yes, first I just wanna shout out to all my Canadian pals. Some of my best friends in the world are here right now, especially from Toronto and Montreal. I'm so happy to see you. I look forward to crossing that border soon. So let me say that I've always had trouble getting published. In fact, um, I, I, for 10 years, I couldn't get any book published and I had four books, uh, including Gentrification of the Mind, which is now one of my successful books that I couldn't get anyone to take. And I think the problem has always been that I've been ahead. And you know, uh, it's always better to be the fifth person saying something than the first person because you know, they look at it and it's not familiar. And so they think it's wrong because of this conflation that we have between art and entertainment, that being told what we already know is what makes something good. So there's been that issue. Uh, but basically what's, what happened with this book is that absolutely no one in the United States would publish it. And I mean, no one, not only presses like Grove, but my own publishers like Duke University Press, where I've had a number of books or the Feminist Press, where I've had a number of books, Verso, Nobody. And in trying to understand it, um, I, what I understood it to be was that subjects like HIV criminalization or even Palestine create so much anxiety in Americans that they can never be used as examples for larger ideas. They're so stigmatized that they can only be treated discreetly. And so that's, I think, what scared people. And I went to Brian Lamb at Arsenal Pulp, who I had published many books with, reprints, new books, all kinds of things. And he read it and we met in person. And I was like, will you publish it? And he's like, yes. And I almost started crying. It was so, I was like, thank you. But I thought, okay, this book is gonna totally disappear. It's gonna come out in Vancouver from a queer press and no one's ever gonna read it. But that's not what happened. What happened was that the publishing mechanism ignored it completely. Publishers Weekly, who has reviewed almost every book I've written, ignored it, did not review it. I couldn't get reviewed anywhere, but the people were interested in it. And so this kind of grassroots discussion emerged mostly through like Goodreads and on the internet. Now that, com that discussion was very complex. But as I started going on book tour, and I wanna to say that, you know, because Canadian presses are subsidized, 
they are in quite a different position than US presses. And so not only was my book subsidized by the Canadian government, but my book tour was subsidized. Whereas when I publish with an American small press, I can't go on tour because there's no money for that. But as I started touring with the book, the audiences started getting bigger and bigger. I remember like I started in Montreal and it was, you know, it was full, but it wasn't overwhelming. By the time I got to Seattle, I had 400 people. Something was happening out there and the audiences were younger and younger, like people in their 20s. And I started to realize that they were coming because they were experiencing what has now dreadfully been called cancel culture, which was something that I had not taken into consideration at all and wasn't writing about. And I think I mentioned it once, but they were extrapolating from what I was talking about to what they were living. And that's how this whole debate emerged. So Conflict was published just before, I think published just before Trump got elected in, in 2016. Um, but of course you were writing the book for a couple of years even before that. And potentially you could even say you've been writing this book for the last 38 years since you wrote your novel, your first novel in your early twenties. But could you talk about like the moment, like why you felt compelled to finally spell out your theory of accountability in such a direct way, like in that moment, what were the things going on in 2015, 2016 that were important to that context? Well, I'd like to go further back. I was thinking about this today. Um, you know, I think when I was growing up, for most of my early life, I had an existence problem, which was that what I was was not supposed to exist. And I don't just mean a lesbian, but I also mean a smart girl. And so there was a neg constant negation going on. And you know, for the first 40 years of my life, a lesbian was a person who either hated men or wanted to be a man. So if you weren't in relationship to men, you didn't exist. I, I address this in my 1992 book, Empathy. But, you know, and so I had, I had an existence problem and I was struggling with it. And I think that the thing that changed it was the publication, and you're, you're a real professor, so you'll know what year this was, of an article by Adrian Rich in Science Magazine that was called Compulsory Heterosexuality and Lesbian Existence. Is that like 81 or something like that? I don't know the date. Yeah. I just assigned it last week and I don't oh, know okay. the <laughs> I read that article and I think I was still in college. And believe me, it was not assigned in college. Let's be clear about that. And it said, heterosexuality presents itself, itself as objective, neutral, and value-free. But actually, it is organized and imposed by force. And I was like, oh. You know, things that pretend to have no structure, that pretend that they are just the way things are, are actually rife with structure. And this was reinforced in, I was a student at Hunter College and Audre Lorde was my professor. And she said to our class that you can't fight City Hall is a rumor being spread by City Hall, which is the same idea that you're constantly being told that your subjugation or your marginalization is just the way things are and that's the way it's always going to be. This opened this enormous door for me and this really, like I would say, has framed almost everything I've done since then, you know. So th the question was, things that you're being presented with, what are they really? And so I've spent my whole life looking in, at the air and trying to identify what the invisible structures are that are marginalizing people or disempowering people. And I think the first time I started really addressing it consciously was when I wrote this book, Ties That Bind familial homophobia and its consequences, which was one of those books that took 10 years to get published that absolutely no one would publish. And it was the very first book analyzing homophobia in the family. And I coined the phrase familial homophobia and all of that. But in that book, I had the revelation that the homophobic family blames the queer family member, creates them as the negative object, that they are dangerous, that they must be removed that they must be made invisible. But the truth is, the problem is the family's homophobia. So this revelation helped me understand a lot of things. And I think that it was, it played a big role in my ability to finally challenge Israeli occupation of Palestine, 
which I came to very, very late. And this is something I'm very embarrassed about and ashamed of is how late it took me to do the work to actually deconstruct the fake Jewish victimhood trope that is behind Zionism. And I think that, you know, going through this other process of looking at familial homophobia allowed me to do that. Okay, so that's a lot of the background. And then you get to 2014. And I, and as I say in the opening, you know, there were three events that the book focuses on. One is the police murder of two black men, Michael Brown and Eric Garner. Uh, one is the violent, domestic violence of an NFL linebacker named Ray Rice, who was videotaped knocking his wife unconscious in an elevator. And then the third and most significant is the Israeli aerial war on Gaza in 2014. So here you have three events, one very intimate, right, between and a couple. One that is the state against the people, and one that is between two peoples, that is geopolitical. But the, the rhetorics of these three events were all resonating with each other. That a person who felt somehow endangered by otherness, by difference, or by opposition, conceptualize themselves as victims when they were in fact the perpetrators. It was so clear. And that's when I started writing this book. And the book starts with the intimate and builds the tropes to going through events such as HIV criminalization in Canada, which is very significant to the argument and ending with the Israeli war on Gaza. Now, I wanna say something about the way it's written. I'm a novelist. And so I write cumulatively. In other words, I'm a storyteller. I'm not one of those people who in nonfiction has like seven articles and then puts them together. So as you read, there's a trope that evolves and there's an argument that builds and builds and builds. And in the end, you have the conclusion. And my model, I think the book that does this the best is Edith Wharton's The Age of Innocence where every single thing that she drops lands. So my book is not a book where you can open it to page 18 and read one sentence and not like it and say that you disagree with everything in the whole book. You have to go with it to see what the idea is. Okay, well, it seems to me that that is not how uh, people have interacted with the book exactly. Um, you know, people love to cite this book. It's a hashtag. Conflict is not a hashtag. Conflict is not abuse is, is a thing. And sometimes I think it oftentimes is used as you have intended it as reflecting somebody who has engaged with the ideas from beginning to end and thought through that that build and, and kind of revelation. Um, but sometimes it's distorted. So, Very much so. can you talk about think, some of the most? Oh, di sure. Well, Margaret Atwood. Margaret Atwood is one of the biggest examples. She clearly did not read the book. Okay, so she was involved in this conflict, um, you know, at the university in British Columbia with this professor who had been accused of slapping a female student. I don't have all the details, but she had signed on to a letter supporting him. This is intra-Canadian. This story has not come to the United States. And so she was defending herself and she tweeted a picture of my book and said, conflict is not abuse, a book for our time. And as much as I believe me, I want to be appreciated by Margaret Atwood, but I had to write back and say like, I think if you read this book, you will not tweet this because she was also accepting a million dollars from the Israeli state that year because she had been awarded an Israeli state literature prize. So clearly she did not agree with the book. She hadn't even cracked it. So that would be the most egregious, I would say, use of that. I mean, Kim Kardashian um, also tweeted it and it was also spoken in the British parliament. But you know, people use the Bible to justify slavery. I mean, you can use anything to justify anything. You can use the, any word to justify anything. So the fact that, that people can, um, can claim meaning that isn't there, that's really on them. And certainly writers should read books before they cite them. I mean, agreed. 
do you think though, like if you had to, I mean, you said earlier that um, a lot of readers, particularly younger readers extrapolated that they read the book in a certain way and made the meaning that they needed to make out of it. Um, in, in some obviously very productive ways, but I think in other ways that actually are distortions of some of your ideas. And you know, there are people listening here who haven't, you know, many people haven't read the book. You know, I outlined some of the main ideas, but I'm curious if you see any major distortions that you would oh, love yeah. to address. Well, what the book is saying in a nutshell is that the refusal of groups, and by groups, I mean cliques, families, communities, religious entities, nation states, the refusal of those groups to support their members in being accountable to self-criticism and negotiation, that refusal leads to increased power of the state. And that is what I'm showing over and over and over again, whether it's between two lovers where one is HIV positive, right? Whether it's between people who file for false I mean, uh, I show, I have, I rely a great deal on the work of Catherine Hodes, a social worker who actually created the phrase conflict is not abuse. And I go a lot into her work, but she shows that increasingly perpetrators are the first to file leader, legal letters or to ask for restraining orders, that they seize the whole mechanism that's supposed to protect victims, you know, all of this kind of thing. So this idea is the basic idea. If you let your friends scapegoat people and you participate in group shunning and bullying and all of this kind of carceral social behavior, what you're doing is you're enhancing the power of the state. That's the argument. What, people, what some people have done is turned it into like self-help for leftists. Okay, they ignore all the stuff about the state. I don't think they actually read it. I think what they read is the excerpt that's on Amazon. And they're only focused narcissistically on like relationship stuff and their friends and all of that. But they haven't read it. I mean, there's so many comments about people saying, well, she never defines conflict and abuse. That's like one of the most common criticisms, but it's defined right away, at, you know, in, in chapter two. So I'm like, well, did you actually read this thing? So I think that that's, that's the biggest distortion is make, re reducing it to a narcissistic issue about individuals. Okay, well, I think this whole idea of people thinking in terms of groups, good groups, bad groups, whether that's a family or a clique or a, a workplace or a state, uh, one of the things that seems really important to say about being part of a good group is that it's it's very difficult to do. It's, it's hard to be in a good group in a certain way. Um, it's hard to talk, listen, and work things out sometimes, particularly in our you know, political economy where our lives are mostly not structured to let us devote so much time to those conversations. I remember a revelation I had after reading the book is how few people actually I would be really willing and prepared to do that very, very, very time consuming work for. I think it, it forced me to rethink what I even meant by, by community. But I do think that part of, I mean, I don't know that I would see it as narcissistic, but I do think that people are really flailing to try to figure out how to make a place for that emotional labor in their lives. Um, and you know, there's just so much talk about burnout. It's just a really, common thing for whatever reason. People are talking about feeling burned out in contrast to maybe nourished by their, their social and political worlds. So I guess a, a practical question, if you will indulge going down this kind of interpersonal track, which I think people still really do want to talk about, is how can we know the limit or the extent to which we're entitled to each other's time? How can we know when it is our duty to intervene or negotiate? How can we know where that begins and ends? Or even if you want to put that in terms of your own experience, because certainly you've had to learn for yourself where to draw the line. Well, I'm gonna disagree with you here because okay. I think that it's a lot less time consuming to pick up a phone and call someone and say, wow, we've really gotten crazy. Why do you think this is happening? And just fully have that conversation than to stare at them across the room and freeze them out for 20 years. <laughs> I'm serious. 
Because once people get locked into a position of supremacy, where they determine that somebody else is not allowed to be spoken to, and we should break that down also. Yeah. Once they get locked in that, it's very hard for them to let go of that. So you'll have people, you know, being icy and cold and mean for decades. They don't even remember why they're doing it. And they can't give you a coherent reason why, you know, rather than be uncomfortable. Well, that's a good point. And that is also energy consuming. And it also leads to a lot of rumor mongering and a lot of getting further and further away from what actually happens. I mean, establishing the chronology of events can be, is a useful tool for, for mediating conflict. Right, whisper campaigns function on all levels. You know, for example, the New York Times will not publish very much from Palestinian point of view. So if you read the Palace, if you read the New York Times, you will never know what Palestinians think about anything. Right, so there's a whisper campaign. The Palestinians are this, the Palestinians are that. Like I just heard Terry Gross interview the author of a Palestinian cookbook and she asked her about suicide bombers. And I'm like, what kind of crap is that? You know, so it's just like this constant revilification of people. It's always out there with whisper campaigns. But if you can read a Palestinian newspaper or you can listen to a Palestinian speaker, or if you're told that there's a person who someone in your clique is mad at and you should be mean to them forever, if you actually pick up the phone and ask them, why do you think this is happening? You may not end up agreeing with everything they say, but the chances that you will not be spending the rest of your life having to hate that person to prove loyalty to your group are high. So this whisper campaign thing functions on so many levels. Yeah. Okay, well, one of the areas that kind of overlaps, but I think is actually really distinct from what we're talking about is the kind of the, the cultural crisis or series of revelations that amount to the Me Too moment or, or movement. Um, you know, and when it's one of these things where the, the timing of this book coincided with that, but it's not really written in some ways to address Me Too because a lot of what's happening there is an actual experiences of power over, in other words, abuse, not talking about the realm of conflict, but people often project onto this book the expectation that it will also help them deal with situations of abuse, which it doesn't. And I think that's one of the areas I see uh, really, there's a lot of distortion there. Um, but I guess I'd like to ask you what you think this book could offer us or your ideas around this could offer us in terms of thinking through the sort of shocks and growing pains of cultural transformation around kind of sexual assault and sexual misconduct. Well, it's hard because I, you know, I don't, I haven't, I don't think I have much to offer on that that isn't already out there. And it's not really my subject. Like right now, my book is coming out in French and every interview is, what do you think about me too? And I'm like, right. my book is not about me too, right. you know, but I, I would be interested in less focus on the prurient aspects of beautiful women being sexually um, harassed by troll, ugly, rich men. And it's let that expand a little bit more to sexism itself. And how does sexism function in excluding women or controlling women who have ambitions or who are trying to just earn a living? And it's weird that it's stayed focused on sex and it can't go to the next step, but that's for somebody else to do. Okay. And I, I often say the same thing too when I'm discussing this book uh, and people want to apply it to so many situations. I think it's really important not to, to assume that the message of this book is that there is no abuse and that it's all conflict. And no, I say that at the beginning. I, I, I say really know, but there, there are thousands of volumes of books about abuse. And I, do, I think I even say, and I do not wish to reproduce that information here. Right. But this book is about conflict. Yeah, power struggle. Well, one of the things that I think is um, maybe a lightning rod for some people in making that conflation is this idea uh, that the book really asks you to be open to self-criticism and people feel very endangered by that. Um, and we've talked about that kind of in the interactions, even with the book, that people kind of reenact the arguments of the book uh, in certain ways. And I guess, 
I don't know, do you have anything to say about how people can learn to be self-critical? Because it's hard. Um, and you well, do talk about this again in the book, but for people who haven't read it, and where do you see examples of that taking place sort of positively in, in the larger culture? Okay, so let me break that down a little bit. I think right. that one of the best revelations in the book, and I mean, this book has filled with ideas and some of them are wonky. And that's why I put the thing at the beginning saying like, there's no one on earth who could agree with everything in this book. But I think really one of the best ideas is that this conflation of conflict with abuse can be attributed to dominance, but it can also be attributed to trauma. And let me go into that a little bit. So when you're dominant, you're, you grow up in a way that you're never asked to challenge your own positionality. And if somebody disagrees with you or is different than you, or even opposes you in such a manner where you might have to face things about yourself that are uncomfortable, people can experience that discomfort as an assault or an attack when it's not. But when you're traumatized, sometimes it's so hard to just keep it together that the idea that someone else's difference or someone else's opposition means that you would have to be self-critical, feels like you're just gonna fall apart and it's all gonna come tumbling down. And so, so you can get the same sense of reducing other people's difference to attack in trauma and in dominance, right? So, okay, so can you just cue me in a little bit your, your question again so that I can? Yeah, I mean, I'm wondering if you can speak to ways that people learn oh, yeah. to become okay. self-critical. Thank you. So right now we have this concept of loyalty in our groups, our cliques, our communities, whatever, that we are loyal to our friends if we hurt the people that they don't like. And I mean, as a Jewish person born in 1958, 13 years after the end of the Holocaust, this has been such a huge force in international Zionism that because we have family members in Israel, because our families were hurt by the Holocaust, whatever, we're supposed to defend the Israeli state no matter what. And that same construction exists in cliques. You know, it's like your friend broke up with her girlfriend, so you have to be mean to the girlfriend for 30 years because that shows that you're a good friend. So I'm proposing a, com a completely different definition of loyalty, one based more on something like Jewish Voice for Peace, which you and I both belong to, which is an organization of 18,000 people who are Jewish primarily and support Palestinian rights and oppose the opposition, the occupation. This idea that real loyalty and true friendship and real love means supporting people in being honest in their self-criticism and in negotiation. Right now, we have a definition of that in order to, to get support, you have to be the cleanest, most pure victim that ever existed. You know, you have to be the Virgin Mary for anybody to support you. If you acknowledge that you have participated in, in escalation or that you've contributed to the problem in some way, then you're subjected to blame. So if we can support people to be honest about their participation and embrace them with our love to encourage them to negotiate, then we are true friends and we are expecting, we are expressing true love. So I think that the solution to this entire thing has to do with third party intervention. And that is a concept that I originated in Ties That Bind, that when, when, when queer people are being treated badly by their homophobic families, it is the responsibility for other people to intervene, to not recognize the family as a superior entity that you're not allowed to talk to, that other people should be calling queer people's families and saying, listen, this is a person who is cared about. This is a person who is respected. And this situation in your family needs to change. And that's what we need to do, as whether as diasporic Jews or whether as people in little art cliques in Toronto, whatever it is, our job is to communicate. Now, the question is, why do people not want to communicate? And there's a lot of reasons to that. Yeah, sure. You know, people have problems with each other and they need to take a break, right, to reassess and, and come back together. But the real reason that we don't wanna to talk to somebody that we're supposed to be hurting, 
whether it's a person with HIV in Canada who we've had sex with, or whether it's like some, someone in our family, is because the information that we will get from talking to them will make us change our self-concept. And that's painful. And that's why people stay locked in these ridiculous positions for their entire lives because they can't take the pain of change. But if your friends will help you and want you to change and reward you for communicating, then you'll have a, a better opportunity. Can you talk? I mean, I thank you for that. I, you know, mm -hmm. I sort of like that walkthrough. I'm wondering. You know, it's, it seems easy to identify um, all the ways that that is not happening in, in you know, broadly in society, whether that's sort of uh, geopolitical events or, but I think there, it also is happening sometimes. And I see there, I'm wondering if you see, never mind what I see, no one's here to, <laughs> but I'm wondering if you see kind of important cultural examples of that. Because people need examples, people need to see it working sometimes to be able to imagine changing their own self-conception or, or being part of that process with their own friends. Well, hopefully we're, we're, we're moving into a big 10 period in politics right now. I mean, I have this huge book coming out. I actually have it here to show everybody. Okay, this is it. It's a history of ACT UP New York, 750 pages. It's coming out May 18th. And there I look at, you know, um, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power in New York City uh, in the late 80s and early 90s and what they did right and what they did wrong and why they were successful to the extent that they were. And one of the main reasons that they were successful is that they did not use consensus. And that is such a hugely important piece of information. So, and it wasn't because they theoretically were against consensus. They never actually theorized themselves. It just became the practice. So that if you wanted to get arrested in the Lower East Side doing needle exchange to do a test case to make needle exchange legal in New York, and I thought that was terrible, I just wouldn't do it. I wouldn't try to stop you from doing it. If I wanted to go interrupt mass at St. Patrick's Cathedral and you didn't want to, you wouldn't go. But there was this way that in a radical democracy, people are encouraged and supported to respond in the way that makes sense to them. So there was a, a, a statement of unity in ACT UP, which was direct action to end the AIDS crisis. And that's it. That was the only statement of unity. So direct action as opposed to social services to end the AIDS crisis. And within that rubric, so many different kinds of people did so many different kinds of things in so many different ways that they produced a paradigm shift through simultaneity of response. And so if we can, and I do see a little bit the reemergence of this concept now. I think, you know, because there's so much police violence against black people in the United States, and this has become the rallying cry. I mean, the, the, the demonstrations this summer, the demonstrations last night, the subtext is COVID, but there's something much bigger there. And, you know, and the principle of unity is quite small. And there's so many different kinds of people who are responding to it. And that's the way to build successful movements. I think historically, there's not a single movement in history that forced people to all think the same or use the same strategy or use the same analysis or the same words that succeeded. And so, and, and that gets back to our kind of the negative group versus the positive group. When the negative group demands lockstep, then there's something very distorted in those relationships and it does not have a good outcome. I think there's a lot packed in there that also has implications for how we handle free speech debates. I mean, a strategy I think that a lot of people who have been supportive, particularly of Palestinian human rights have, have understood is that if you start to censor free speech around certain things, that that can kind of come around and um, bite you. But if you kind of allow an approach of, well, if you don't agree with that, do your own thing and, and you don't shut it down directly, but you set, you, you offer an alternative. I mean, I think that's kind of an important political vision. I mean, do you wanna say anything about free speech? In relation sure, to that? I mean, you see it that I know way? that Canada and the US have very different ideas about freedom of speech. And I know this from personal experience, having 
testified in the famous Little Sisters case in Vancouver. But you know, in the United States, where we are right now, is that every time freedom of speech is controlled, whether it's in the guise of hate crimes legislation or in any kind of situation, it falls on Palestinians over and over again. They are the ones who, who carry the burden of those restrictions. You know, um, this, the, the trap of hate crimes laws, for example, or uh, social habits is this, this current campaign that we're dealing with where criticisms of the Israeli state are mislabeled as anti-Semitism, which they are not, and are used to shut down student groups, students for justice in Palestine at schools like Fordham University, or even Facebook is claiming that criticism of the Israeli state is anti-Semitism and is looking to use, if someone uses the word Zionism, they are, they are hoping to use that as a flag of, to repress. So, you know, Oh, what we find, we find is that any effort to restrict speech from above always ends up hurting the most vulnerable. And the best answer to speech is more speech. Just like the best answer to these types of um, silo, carceral, social, and geopolitical movements is more communication. Doesn't mean that you're all gonna agree in the end or that everyone's gonna be friends, but that what we need is more discomfort. And, you know, I was very influenced about this by Sarah Ahmed, who's someone that I read a lot and rely on a lot. And in her book, The Pursuit of Happiness, she talks about how the, the demand to always be comfortable is a demand of supremacy. And the only way that a person can always be comfortable is if other people are suppressed. And that in a healthy society, we are always uncomfortable because we're constantly surrounded by difference and other people's needs. And that's what we should strive for. Thank you for that. That actually would be a really good note to end on, but I have a couple more questions <laughs> that I wonder if we could talk about. So this book was published five years ago. You've had five more years to add thoughts and to think through. I'm wondering if there's anything you'd emphasize more or say differently if you were writing the book now. My biggest error, I think, in this book was not understanding that different generations have different relationships to social media. And I have a huge bias in this book to, against people using email to deal with conflict instead of speaking to each other. And many, many, many younger people, and I'm only getting older, so there's more and more younger people insist that they can resolve conflicts through social media. I still don't see that, but I actually should have thought about it and need to know more about that and understand that because it is our reality, especially under COVID. So that was the biggest mistake. I do think that time has been on my side, however. So for example, one of the things that people really misrepresented in this book, I talked about the phrase, believe women. And in the book, I said, you know, Let's look historically. I gave the example of, the Sc of Scottsboro in the United States. W white women have consistently historically been in a position of misrepresenting or lying about uh, sexual assault by black men and causing black men to be incarcerated and murdered. So based on the racial history, a statement like believe women is not, does not make sense. So when people criticize this, they left out the whole racial context. And they just said, she's against believe women. She's a terrible person. She's an abuser, blah, 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 blah. But since then we've had Amy Cooper, you know, the Canadian woman who was in Central Park calling the police on a black man because he wanted her to leash her dog. Was she Canadian? Oh yes, dear. Very <gasps> true. <laughs> and we have, you know, the, the woman police officer who killed a young man in Minneapolis two days ago. We've had uh, a black woman police officer who was involved in the Freddie Gray murder in Baltimore. I mean, I think it's become very, very clear that believe women is not doing the work that it was supposed to do. What it was addressing is that women are not believed. And that is, that is a fact. We are not believed about our experiences. But the answer is not to lose all nuance and to lose all, all sense of evaluation. So, you know, that, that was something that I think has really played out clearly 
in a way that still is relevant, if not more so. Yeah, I think one of the big asks of the book is that we hold those kinds of tensions to say, yeah, we live in a world where abuse is not, people are not doing enough about actual abuse, where women are, people are not believed when they talk about experiences of being victimized. And simultaneously, there are many other situations where that easy, not asking of questions sort of erases an obligation to try to figure out what really happened for the purposes of actually conflict resolution. Uh, and it's hard to hold both those things, especially because no matter what we do and how good our books are and how careful our writing is, people are always gonna disagree about the meaning of things. Well, our mutual friend, Will Burton, the French professor at Berkeley, uh, pointed out to me that, you know, the world is divided into people who believe in the unconscious and people who don't believe in the unconscious. Now, as a Jewish intellectual from New York who was born in the 1950s, I believe in the unconscious, which means that I believe that we're not in touch with all of our motivations. And that, you know, the, the, the struggle to be an integrated person is to get as close as you can to trying to be open to see what your real motivations are. But people who don't believe in the unconscious find that very offensive. The idea that they may be acting on something that they're not in touch with, they think that that's an insult. You know, so I, that's a really big divide in how people look at complexity. Yeah, but I do think that, that people think it's an insult because again, we live in a world where people are not feeling like they're gonna be eligible for humane treatment unless they have access to all of their motives all the time. It, it feels like it's, it's too vulnerable to say, uh, I, I didn't, hadn't thought about that or that really wasn't on my radar. Or, that's not what I meant. You know, people don't right, want to risk you have to be a, You have to be a complete victim to be eligible for compassion. And my view is that every person who needs help should have it. We, should, we are all eligible for compassion. No matter what's happened, you know, we need to be able to be heard and to deal with people where they are. And, you know, and I think that there's a lot of, of talk about that out there. You know, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful about that. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for all the ideas you've already shared. I think this is probably a good time to bring in the audience. So, um, Ange, what's the first question we've got for Sarah? Uh, yeah, the first question uh, is from Sam. And Sam uh, says, do you stand by your statements against email, text, phone calls as outlined in conflict is not abuse? And you may want to expand on what what your stance is. Yeah, I think I just I think I just mentioned that in the conversation. Um, I do understand that there's gender differences. I mean, uh, generational differences in how we experience those things. I still think that instead of sending people mean emails and mean texts, it is better to pick up the phone and be interactive. Because, you know, when you're interactive, the other person's reality is more present than when you're monoactive. Okay, is, are there other questions in the pipeline? I feel like there's a lot. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, there is quite a few questions. Uh, the next one is from Sarah. Uh, and Sarah says, I've often thought about the different scales of your subjects in conflict and admired the kinds of imaginative challenges that arise from your comparative analysis of these rhetorics. I'd love to hear you speak about any critical or practice-based responses inspired by your analysis and conflict uh, that are doing the kind of work at any scale that your book is calling for. I don't, I don't have an answer for that. Would, would you like the next question then? Or? Sure, yeah, I'm sorry, I wish I did, yeah. Okay, uh, would you have any advice in handling conflict with people, including family who are transphobic? Well, I think the most, you know, my suggestion has always been third party intervention. I think third party intervention is the essence to all of this transformation. When families are, um, subjecting queer or trans family members to projected cruelties and marginalizations, other people need to get involved. And I know that we hesitate to do that because we have a concept of the family that protects it from the humanity of the, of the member that they wish to project onto. But, you know, 
call them up. Hi, you don't know me, but your child is a very beloved person who belongs to a community that values them. And you don't, you're not seeing them in the context of who they really are. You know, even meeting with the family, like open up the protective shell of the perpetrators and give them interaction and communication with third parties who are gonna intervene on behalf of the despised object, whoever that is. Okay, next question. Uh, how do you feel about the way some people expect you to give them money in response to educating you to compensate for the burden stress of educating you? Uh, you mean, do I, do I think education should be free? Yes. Is that the question? I think it's more the example is on a one off basis in the context of a comment thread on the internet that people want to be paid for. I don't, I'm not familiar with that. This is my creaking old age here. I'm not familiar with people wanting to be paid in that context. Oh, okay. I, I maybe just a little, I think maybe what this is referring to is not, not the question of should there be public education or free education. I think it's oh. more like a lot of people who spend a lot of, of their labor um, kind of dealing with like anti-oppressive politics, particularly on, on media, like, like on Instagram or, you know, people who have um, blogs or whatever, there's often like a way to pay people for the kind of educative work they're doing, I think particularly on social media. Are you familiar with that kind of thing? Uh, not really, no, I'm not. Okay, but sure, why not? I mean, why not support people whose, whose work you admire? Uh, the next question, are there any constructive ways to approach bullying and exclusion from spiritual communities for LGBTQ folks? Well, I think it's the same for every kind of community. It's, you know, other people need to get involved and talk to the people involved and express to them that they really want to help them and support them in negotiating. You know, whether that's people fighting against HIV criminalization, whether it's Jewish Voice for Peace, whether it's your friends, you know, that's, that's our job as people in, this, in the social world is to help each other be self-critical and negotiate and communicate. I wonder if the spiritual uh, community part makes it feel different for people, if people's expectations of certain kinds of community uh, leave them more like shocked and devastated maybe when things don't, when even in those kinds of spaces where people thought they were safe, they have to confront things they didn't expect to. Yeah, that could be, I'm not, I don't know anything about that. Sorry, people, I'm not doing well here. Okay, let's see what's next. Uh, yeah, the next one is from Matt, and Matt says, uh, how can people understand and strongly agree with what you were saying on one level, still reject the analysis at another level? What can sustain hypocrisy like this? Do you have an example, Matt? You know, it's so like one of the things in the book that I keep going into is that you really need to know the specifics. The specifics of situations are what reveal their truths, and that's why we need to talk to all the parties and try to understand the order of events. So, you know, why are people hypocritical? Because we're human and we're vulnerable and we have fear and we don't understand, um, you know, or because there's some uh, power investment in it and there's a payoff and a reward. I mean, it depends on whether you're coming from a dominant point of view or a tra traumatized point of view. And of course, th those are not discrete. The same person can occupy both of those spaces. Next question. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the next one is from Heather. Heather says, Sarah, do you see this negative group lockstep and group decision making, which requires consensus or even various forms of majoritarian decision making, as being tied to reproducing state decision making systems, which are based on coercion rather than voluntary associations where people don't have to follow the decisions and persuasion and a diversity of activities are inevitable? I mean, that sounds right. I would have to say, I would need to know the specifics of any example to really say yes or no, but I mean, that resonates with me. Can I pause further questions and just let's, let, 
pause for a second to ask about this question of specifics. I know in a lot of communities where real abuse has occurred, there's a big block to this idea that people should feel entitled to specific information. And sometimes that process of having to relive one's actual abuse. And again, I, I think this is really an instance where that's not what you're talking about, but I know, and I hear all the time in the conversations I have with people, that that's what seems like is being asked for. Can you comment on this? Like, okay. how can we know when we're asking to re-traumatize people and when we're getting the kinds of information we need to be ethical participants as community okay, members? Well, a lot of this comes from the work of Catherine Hodes, who was an advocate for um, women who were in domestic violence situations. Um, so, if a person is in any way participating in escalating a problem, even if their participation is not equal to the other person, and even if the consequence on them is worse than on the other person, it means that they have some power and that they can change some things. Whereas, and that's what conflict is. Whereas if you're in an abuse situation, which is power over, which means nothing that you do contributes to the escalation or can de-escalate, like in a structural racism situation, for example, right? I would think that we would want to discover that we have some power in a situation and that we can create some change. However, because of the demand of being a total victim, unless, uh, otherwise no one's gonna help you or care about you. The, the question of, do you have any participation seems implicating because of the way that we blame the victim. So we're caught in this paradigm that if we really look to see, do we have the power to make some change in this situation, that that's blame. And it's, it's only blame if you have to be 100% a victim to get any support. But if the people around you allow for nuanced self-criticism and recognition of your own role, then you don't have to be a complete victim. And then the, the learning that you have some power is good. It's, it, it helps you change, have some say over how your life will change. So that's where I think the, the confusion is. One of the things that Catherine Hodes proposes is this issue of origin of uh, the order of events that, you know, and I can do that with myself. I'm having a fight with somebody and I go, well, what are the order of events? She did this and she did this and she did this and she did this and then I, and then she did this and she did this. So when I get to me, I smush it, you know, so that I don't have to really see what I did that helped make the situation worse because then I'm 100% guilty and I don't get any support. So that's why I think these two things get conflated. But it's very, if someone, you know, anyone can accuse anybody of anything. You know, you could accuse people of murdering children and drinking their blood, like the protocols of Zion, or you can accuse people of anything. But if someone is accused, the only truth you know is that they've been accused. You know nothing about what's actually occurred. And the only way you can find out is by asking them. The question, why do you think this is happening, is the greatest question to ask somebody who you are being asked to hurt. You know, because that, that information can change you. And that's why people don't want to ask it, because they're afraid of change. And we talked about that earlier. Thanks for that, Lana. Next question. It, uh, the next question, uh, somebody asks, how does how do we rebuild the community when queer folks are starting groups that purposely exclude trans folks because they are feeling attacked, erased, and marginalized in their own so-called community? Uh, and when any mention of female-only spaces gets labeled as being a turf. Okay, I don't totally understand the question. Um, I mean, I used to participate, for example, for five years, I was on the stage crew. Uh, the stage crew security of the Michigan Women's Music Festival. And when it became clear that they were excluding trans women, I ceased to participate with a group of many others like Michelle T and a lot of other people. We never went back after that. And, you know, I understand that this is at a level of insane, cruel victimization, rife with whisper campaign, 
and um, and just cruelty towards trans people. I see that, uh, and I I hope and expect that that balance will shift um, because it's untenable as a position, and th these kind of arguments to justify it uh, don't make any sense. So I'm hoping that that will will change out and that this moment will dissipate because I think that the trans exclusionary position is not sustainable and, and will eventually dissipate. That's my, that's my view. Is that what that person is asking? I'm not sure. I'm not quite sure either. Uh, that was just the question that was up there. Uh, the next one is from Ben. Uh, ben asked, just reckon, it says, just recognizing that intervening as a third party takes a lot of work and resources. How do you see that being resourced? Yeah, I, as I said to Lana, I think it's easier to deal with things as they're happening than to hold grudges and participate in factionalism for the rest of your life. And when people refuse to deal with problems, believe me, these things go on forever. You know, and the person doesn't remember why they're being mean to you and they can't apologize, they can't go back and it, they carry it all their lives. So I actually think it saves time to talk to people and, and deal with it. And sometimes you can only have a couple of conversations, but if someone asks you to help them by intervening and you call the party or you talk to them and you have a few conversations with them and the conversations are uncomfortable or whatever, okay, you were uncomfortable, but at least you showed that you tried. And the person who's being um, marginalized, they know that you're trying. And if you can't ultimately overcome the situation, then you can't, but at least you tried. And that trying means a lot to people. That's, that's part of solidarity. Sometimes you can't be successful or you can't be successful right away. Can I just add to that? I, I also like in some ways feel the kind of insufficiency of of this answer of not being able to spell out for other people like what the limits actually should be. I think, I mean, I asked that question to you because I struggle with this a lot, but I also think from the other perspective that trying to find out what one's own limits are in terms of like how accountable and how helpful they can be is a valuable thing. And like, even if you don't know where quite the process ends, you come to know where your limits are. I come to know where my limits are, I think just by trying to be available in those ways. And there's a difference between saying, listen, I, I'm tired. There's only so many hours in the day. I can't call this person again. I can't do this again. After you've been doing it for a, a long time, then just deciding from the beginning that you can't and that it's too overwhelming and it's too time consuming. There's so much that one learns on the way through trial and error, like anything in social life. So I don't know. I think it's like a I can see how tempting it is to just not engage in a certain way. I, I know I, I agree that holding grudges for years is exhausting, but also like so is hearing someone give a very, very years long chronology of things and trying to keep track of it and then trying to you know go to somebody else and hear their version. And then maybe there are more people who have versions. And I mean, that's what historians do. It's a lot of work, you know, it takes yeah, years to- It's true, some struggles are very long. And, you know, I think we're getting back to Palestine here because, the Palestinian struggle has been a very long struggle. And for people who've been in solidarity with Palestine, sometimes there is a price to pay for that. Yeah. You know, sometimes you get harassed, sometimes you get charged, falsely accused of things, sometimes you get death threats, sometimes you get all kinds of things. But, um, you know, it's the, it's, the, it's the humane, moral, ethical position. And the fact that other people are gonna make you frightened or uncomfortable well, you have to stand up to that. And that's what it is to be a full person and ditto with your friends. Anything else there? Question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, next one uh, is uh, from somebody says, I often hear, especially with issues like feminism, sexuality, and race, that people that belong to these communities feel exhausted by the burden of having to educate others on their issues and don't wanna bear the burden of constantly educating others and defending their rights. However, third party advocates in these cases, cases are sometimes seen as overstepping or placing themselves into issues in which they don't belong. Is there a way to navigate this? Well, it depends on the specifics, but I mean, I wanna get back just to the Jewish Voice for Peace example. I mean, uh, you know, why should Palestinians have to argue with Zionists? There's no reason, but that's our job. 
right? Our job is to make it Im impossible for people to take anti-Palestinian positions without being challenged. So, you know, um, in that specific example, you know, that's where intervention makes sense. But I'm not, let me just say that one of the important elements of this that I do say very clearly in the book, it's when you are asked to help. Mm. When people ask you for help, because asking for help and not being helped makes you more wounded than you were before you asked. Next. Uh, yeah, the next one is from Dax, and Dax asks, what should we do when someone argues with good faith and sincerity that the expectation of explaining the harm they've endured constitutes another subsequent harm itself? It really depends on the situation. I think one thing it depends on is what are they asking for? If, like right now, if we've been hurt, we feel, the only thing that makes us feel heard is if the other person is punished. Us being heard and the other person being punished are completely connected. But if we could be held and supported and encouraged without that being dependent on the other person necessarily being punished, if we could separate those things, we would be making a huge, huge leap forward. Uh, the next question is from Taro. Uh, Taro asks, how do we build genuine connection and understanding between racial communities within the queer community? How can this wave of violence be used as an opportunity to learn about gay Asian Americas, Americans, Can American Canadian culture? And how do we facilitate these uncomfortable conversations without, uh, without them being shut down? Well, I mean, you, you can't force other people to educate you. <laughs> I mean, but I would say, listen, there's a lot out there and a lot of people are speaking, especially now. And there's, you know, there's a, there's a lot of information that people can take in without putting increased burdens on people who are on the front lines. Okay, next. Uh, the next one is from Elizabeth. Uh, Elizabeth asks, thank you. Well, says, thank you so much. This is fascinating as an LGBT, as LGBTQ folk. Uh, we need to be willing to talk through conflict in compassionate and conscious ways in person, not over email or social media. I'm a 57 year old American lesbian therapist and storyteller and author of a memoir. Most people do not uh, process in person. They hide behind screens and act out from unconscious, from their unconscious parts of their personality. How can we address horizontal hostility? I'm not sure what she means there. So I'm going to assume that I've already answered that. And let's, let's move on. I agree. Let's talk. Talk in person. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we've only got a couple more questions left. Uh, in the book, you describe the manic flight response and the borderline response to conflict in a way that resonates with me. Often the response of friends or even therapists of a mentally ill traumatized person who has committed harm is to attempt to absolve them of blame because of their condition. I was wondering if you could talk about acknowledging the complex culpability of those who cause harm as a result of severe mental illness, such as mania, psychosis, without sacrificing accountability and responsibility. Yeah, this is really complicated, and I do go into this quite a bit in the book. So, you know, as 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 I said before, as a Jewish New Yorker born in mid-century, I recognize that we all have di different levels of conflicts, internal conflicts. And I don't think that saying so is an insult or an attack. However, people who come from cultures or backgrounds that are much more um, afraid of expressing vulnerabilities think that identifying mental illness or identifying consequences of trauma is somehow an attack on somebody and it means that you're saying something bad about them because there's, there's stigma that comes with it and, and punishment. But you know, we have, for people who have severe pain from experiences of the past, and that pain is not resolved, when things in the present remind us of that pain, right? we feel it again, even though it is not happening. And we can blame the person in front of us because we're, we're, those feelings resurface. And that's the famous trigger that we talk about so much. So if we can support each other to recognize that the pain that we're feeling is unresolved from the past when it is, 
and that the people we're projecting it onto are not the cause of it, but that there's no shame or stigma about that. It's just a human experience. Then we can move forward. When we deny that, going back to Will Burton's division between those who believe in the unconscious and the conscious, then we end up finding new victims. There's a really touching part in the book. I think it's in the book. I'm starting to forget which book it's in. Maybe it's somewhere else, but where you talk about instances of people saying they need help, but then like not being prepared to help them get the help. All right, people say, you need help. Therefore, I'm going to hurt you more. Right, yeah. if you think someone needs help, then help them. Yeah, and I think one of the points that maybe gets lost sometimes in this is this idea that help, it can look like like getting involved can look like asking questions. It also can look like a lot of listening. I mean, I see this over and over again, the kind of therapeutic power of just really paying attention to someone. And this is an insight that really my friend Liz Kinnaman has helped me see that the power of pure, of strong attention um, directed at, at someone who, who needs to be heard goes a long way. I mean, it's not everything. It's not an answer, but it's certainly part of what it takes to have people who are capable of healing. And one of the really excellent, I think, sections deals with, with Al-Anon in your book uh, as a kind of model for what that kind of attention can feel like. And you know, there's probably a lot of people on here who, don't, who haven't read that section maybe, or who don't know what Al-Anon is or what kinds of help right. exists for people. Can you talk about that? Well, I look at four. So this, is a, this was a chapter that I really enjoyed working on. I look at four different systems that are really, really different. I looked at traditional psychoanalysis, I looked at pop psychology, I looked at mindfulness, American Buddhism, modern American Buddhism, and I looked at Al-Anon. Now these are systems that are very different, they have very different values, they have different social roles, but they agreed on two things. One is that people need a positive group, a group that gives you space to discover what you are doing in your own life that's not helping you and to look for places of how to move forward without condemning you or intervening, just giving you that space, what Lana's talking about, the listening. And the second thing is that they all, all advocate delay. You know this terrible thing that happens here, I'm gonna go into email again, but you get this horrible email and it's really, really mean. And then you write something back even more mean and escalate and press send. If you delay, <laughs> the chances of you as being the person who escalates it are much, are much less. So, you know, the net, whereas the negative group encourages you to hurt somebody else, the positive group gives you the space to explore how you can be more integrated and try to find solutions. Anything else there, Ange? Uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> the next one uh, is, is there an example from your personal experience where you changed your mind when you'd written someone off? Well, and they'd like, you, why you don't they just say, about, okay, go ahead. I was thinking about that today. When I was very young, I was working on a project and there was an older writer who had published on it. And I wrote her a letter, this is the olden days, asking if she would meet with me and answer some of my questions. And she wrote me back, there's nothing I know that you can't find in a book. Okay, well, these types of people have had a very positive function in my life because they drive me to be a better person. So ever since then, I vowed that, you know, I would support younger writers and I would try to help people and blah, blah, blah. And I always had a thing against this lady. And I followed her for years, you know, trying to watch what was happening to her. Anyway, her life just really fell apart. And her career went down the tubes and her child died. I mean, so many terrible things happened to her. And it's like, um, I'm so glad I didn't act out against her. I'm so glad I didn't vent my rage on her. I'm so glad I turned it into this other thing of trying to help other people in the way that she didn't help me. I don't know that that was the right turn, but um, it really, she was an object of a lot of hostility internally for me for decades, yeah. Uh, next question is from Kara. Uh, Kara says, at the start of this conversation, 
Uh, Lana mentioned that much of your work has related to this topic in a way you've been writing, and in a way you've been writing this for 30 plus years. Do you feel done with this topic or do you find the theme still coming up for you? How does this subject move forward with and for you? Well, this book was like so hard to write because it's a, it's a totally original idea. And I've done a few books, Ties That Bind, Familial Homophobia, on the book, that book, Gentrification of the Mind, Stage Struck, and Conflict is Not Abuse. Those are books that have brand new ideas that carve them out of the air. And um, this was the hardest of them all because this is the one that required me to do the most internal research. Where I had to look so deeply into myself and think things through in such a way that my brain hurt. I mean, it was so hard. And in a way, it's something I just don't ever want to do again. You know, I mean, I'm saying that now. I'm 62, so my time is limited, and I know what I want to do. And I don't think that I want to do something that hard again. So I think for now, this is done. But we'll see. Uh, yeah, another question. Uh, how do you hold the need to pay emotional attention to the person who is oppressed via conflict or, or abuse and call the person who exercised the oppressive behavior? Sometimes I've seen people feel like trying to practice an abolitionist approach to conflict and abuse possibly deprioritizes the oppressed person's experience and state of harm. Well, that's what I'm that what I said earlier that, you know, if people Everybody deserves compassion, regardless. So when people are in pain, let's be there with them. And then, you know, and whatever that means. You know, it, there are people who are mad at someone because they said, said, said something they didn't like and will punish them for 30 years. Then there are people who like want reconciliation with the person who murdered their parents. You know, there are, there's a range of character types that have a very, very different response to transgression, to being injured, to how to respond to criminality or cruelty in another part. And it's just interesting that it's not the act itself that carries the value of how we respond. It's the individual and their own history. And we have to keep that in mind. So when you look at, for example, um, two people could have had the same sexual experience and one person could say, could feel legitimately that they were damaged for the rest of their life from that experience. And another person could have had an identical experience and been like, oh, well. So it's not the experience itself that holds the value. It's our histories and what we bring to it. And that's why we can't universalize to a standard of punishment. So if every person could be met in terms of their level of pain and what they need, not dependent on the other party being punished, we would have a much healthier way of interacting with each other. Can we relate that? Or how, let me say, how can we relate that, do you think, to the conversations around HIV criminalization? Because I think that there's a lot of lessons in, well, counter lessons or, or like negative examples um, in looking at kind of the state framework for that and a lot of options that were advanced, for example, in ACT UP for different ways of like dealing with those nuances. And I, I only bring it up because I feel like that HIV criminalization section is really underplayed. It's, it's not a part in the book that people often talk about, but I think because on the one hand it, it deals with like state punishment, which is something that we're obviously grappling with by the second. And then also like something that's considered to be like this private territory of like, sexual feeling, which is sort of considered off out of bounds in a certain way in people's experience. Can you just sort of talk about that in relation well, to the Well, it's the question? bridge. It's the bridge between the intimate and the social because the government uses the intimate relationship to hurt the person with HIV. They go through the body of the person who's HIV negative and they ask them to denounce or bring charges against the person who's HIV positive, right? But actually, the problem is stigma, because the reality is, if you become HIV infected today, especially in a place that has health insurance of some kind, like Canada, you can live a normal lifespan and get all the medications that you need and never experience a symptom. I mean, you may get a symptom of the medications, but you know, there's so many diseases that are so much worse than HIV. 
So why this global desire to hurt people with HIV? And it's so interesting to look at it in the Canadian context because Canada has this neo neoliberal veneer, but there's incredible viciousness underneath that. You know, and we see it in many, many realms. And you know, because the stigma, because it's associated with anal sex and with needles, carries a kind of vicious, um, almost manic desire to hurt. When you analyze HIV, HIV criminalization in Canada, at the point when I first did the research, half of the people who were incarcerated at that time were black. There's not that many black people in Canada. You know, so you start to understand that this is a racial paranoia against immigrants. And, it's, and when you look at Canadian tabloid press and its representation of people who were charged and prosecuted early on, it builds into that whole thing about the black men as over-sexualized, as sexually dangerous. This is a standard trope of white supremacy. So as you start to, you know, really deep, dig into it, you start to see what the true values are that are being represented. For people who don't just basically know what, how this works or what actually is happening, I realize we sort of skipped over defining. Well, I want to say that I'm not up to date on what the situation with HIV criminalization in Canada is. I know there have been changes since my book came out. Okay, but the thing you're talking the about- The original concept was that if you were HIV positive, and you did not disclose to your sex partner, then you could be charged with a crime. Even if you used a condom, even if you were on HIV meds and therefore your viral level was so repressed that you could not biologically infect anybody. And so this, this is, you know, this is a nightmare crime uh, charge and it was global. So if like, for example, in Taiwan, if you were HIV positive, you could be charged criminally if you had sex with another HIV positive person, which doesn't even make any sense. You know, so none of it made sense. It was just a nation expressing its viciousness and picking people who are endangered and falsely positioning them as dangerous in the same way when you look at Palestinians, in the same way as when you look at the queer person in the family. You know, people who need our support and love being made even more of an object of oppression. And that's the whole phenomena that we're discussing here. Right, and so alternate models then, or ways of, and I, I'm only asking this because it's so in the history, like there are so many ways that people have presented different um, modes of like communicating around sexuality that don't produce these kinds of exclusions. And you were in the thick of it in ACT UP. I mean, can you talk about some of the kind of- We didn't, we didn't have HIV criminalization in ACT UP. HIV right. criminalization, came after there were treatments because it was actually about race panic, anti-immigrant panic, and a real vicious desire to cling to the stigma of HIV. But in the meantime, there's all this great material, these sort of sex positive, like pro-communication pamphlets and messaging and you know messages on billboards and all these things. There are so many ways of doing sort of social policy that don't, Involve um, reinscribing those values over and over. So I don't, right. I just wish well, more people. My original research was published in Slate magazine before I did the book. And I had so many negative, negative, negative comments. Half of them were Canadians who really wanted to hurt people with HIV. And the other half were Canadians who were mad at me because I was as Amer an American. What right did I have to, to talk about this? So, you know, it was, it was a very interesting response. Uh, but yeah, no, I have not, I'm not up to date on where that issue is today. Okay, well, Sarah, before we end, do you wanna offer any sort of final comments about, you know, where you wish these discussions would go, what you'd love to see I think happen. the most important thing is that if, you know, if you are having a conflict with somebody, sit down and talk with them if you can about what you think is happening. And if someone is being singled out or group punished, shunned, there's a whisper campaign about them, whether it's someone you know, or it's, um, for example, what's going on in France now with Macron saying, oh, we have to scrub the academies of the islamo gauchiste you know, which is just like the Jewish Bolshevik, you know, it's the same type of, whether it's social or whether it's intimate, 
your job as a real person is to go to the people with whom you identify and say, how can we bring this down? How can we negotiate this? How can people be heard? And if someone who is an object of group cruelty wants to communicate with you, you should hear what they have to say. Well, thank you for that. Okay. Um, okay, Jim, do you want to come back in and kind of close us out? I can't hear. Is Your audio is not working, Jim. Okay. I'm having a trouble with my microphone. I hope it's working now. I, I was saying I want to thank Sarah and Lana so much for a really engaging uh, conversation. Um, and I want to share with our audience, uh, first of all, to thank them for, for participating, uh, but also to indicate that uh, a uh, video recording of this uh, conversation will be posted on the center's website tomorrow. So if uh, any, you know, anyone who you'd like to have here share your experience today, or if there are parts of it you'd like to hear again, you can go to cfe.ryerson.ca. That's cfe for Center for Free Expression. Um, our next event is going to be a week from today on Tuesday, April 20th, and it's about a completely different subject. It's on broadband access. Uh, how can it be a reality for all? Uh, as the pandemic has made clear, um, good broadband access is essential in the 21st century, especially during the pandemic when often the only way we have to connect with each other is virtually. But it's not available. It's not available in many northern and remote communities in Canada, and it's unaffordable in many places in the south. So there's a really discriminatory impact um, when people are forced to survive uh, through um, virtual means and are denied effective uh, and realistic and affordable access to uh, broadband uh, access. So we hope you'll join our panel that's going to explore these needs with uh, representatives from the North and people in the South uh, to talk about uh, needs and roadblocks and also solutions with examples from elsewhere in the world where broadband access is seen as a human right. Uh, for more information on any of the center's upcoming events, we have one a week, uh, or podcasts of all our past events, again, go to our website, cfe.ryerson.ca. Thank you all so much for being with us today. And thanks again to Sarah and Lana. Goodbye. <laughs>